We're recording. Oh, we are? Okay, great. All right, so we're going to call this meeting to order. And um, our clerk of council, Judy Kittner, is missing her first meeting ever today. She Hi. is homesick. So I'm going to deputize village manager Patty Bates, to be our, Patty Bates to be our deputy clerk. All right, so raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I solemnly swear. I solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And will obey the laws of the United States. And will obey the laws of the United States. And the state of Ohio. And the state of Ohio. That I will in all respects. That I will in all respects. Observe the provisions of the charter. Observe the provisions of the charter. And the ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. The ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of. Deputy Clerk of Council. Deputy Clerk of Council. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. So our first order of business is we have a new officer here. Oh yeah, sorry. We're gonna have Patty call the <laughs> and then we're gonna swear in our new officer. House. Yes. The Queen. Yes. Complain. Yes. Krieger. Yes. Uh, also uh, missing is Councilperson uh, Kevin Stokes. Also present are uh, Chief Carlson, uh, Assistant Village Manager, Finance Director Melissa Dodd, myself, and uh, Village Solicitor Chris Connor. Oh, great. So I would like to invite Richard Neal and <coughs> Mayor Kanai. Uh, for the swearing in. Gene, did, did you want to yeah, I'd just like to say real quick to members of the council and guests and family, we're very excited to add Richard to the YSPD team. Um, it's been a long process, so you're very proud and we're excited. Mary, you want to do the swearing in? Absolutely. Richard, would you stand behind the podium for Ready? I'm ready. On this date, you are hereby commissioned as a peace officer to serve as a police officer for the Yellow Springs Police Department, pursuant to section 737.16 of the Ohio Revised Code. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Richard E. Neal. I, Richard E. Neal. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. And the laws of the United States of America. And the laws of the United States of America. The Constitution and laws of the State of Ohio. The Constitution and laws of the State of Ohio. And the laws and ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. And the laws and ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio. And I will discharge the duties of the Office of Police Officer. And I will discharge the duties of the Office of Police Officer. To which I have been appointed. To which I've been appointed. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. By your signature, you hereby swore or affirmed that the commission issued to you is pursuant to the authority vested in me. And the individual has appeared before me and affixed your signature to this oath in my presence. Congratulations. Jerry. 
Okay, um, and so the only thing that will be different is everyone will say in the name of their commission when we get there, all right? I think you guys all know which ones you are uh, being a part of. Um, okay, so if you will raise your right hand and repeat after me. I solemnly <coughs> affirm, I solemnly affirm that I will support the Constitution, that I will support the Constitution, and will obey the laws of the United States, and will obey the laws of the United States, and the State of Ohio, and the State of Ohio, that I will in all respects, that I will in all respects, observe the provisions of the Charter, observe the provisions of the Charter, and ordinance of the Village of Yellow Springs, and ordinance of the Village of Yellow Springs, and will faithfully discharge the duties. Of the office of. Right. Cool. All right, you guys are sworn in. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kathy. All right. And I think uh, if you guys can sign those before you go, and Patty will grab them. All right, we appreciate your service. I have a pen if anyone needs to borrow. Okay. Um, next on our agenda are announcements. Um, the first announcement I would like to make is that, even though I said the last time and that you would have brown water tomorrow, you will not have brown water tomorrow <coughs> because the valve exerciser did not get delivered as promised. And so it may happen later this week or next week. And as soon as we have a firm date for everyone, we will post that our Facebook page and our website and as well as um, letting the YS News know so that you can have as much notice as possible. And when that does happen again, there will be drinking and cooking water available down in the police department at the dispatch window for you to pick up. Okay. Any other announcements? Okay. Uh, two quick things. Uh, April 7th, opening day for trails. Lots of great stuff happening at the Yellow Springs Station. The YS Brewery is opening that day early at 11 o'clock. So they're going to be part of the festivities as well as Green County Parks and Trails. We've got Green Cats there showing people how to put their bikes on the bike rack on their buses and uh, lots of other stuff. Glenn Holland's going to be there as well and there'll be lots of free giveaways. And the other thing, I wanted to put this just out there so we didn't uh, double <coughs> June 27th is when we will complete the active transportation plan and there will be a community forum from 7 to 8.30 in rooms A and B. So I just want to make sure we have that on our radar. That's uh, months away. All right. Anything else? Okay. Uh, so if not, uh, we have a consent agenda and there is one item which is the minutes from uh, our last meeting, March 5th, uh, so I'll entertain a motion to approve. Um, that's oh. one correction that I found. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's take those off the consent agenda then. Okay. Uh, well, the two typos are page four. Um, under nominations, the third nomination, the last sentence it says between second and, and they should say motions, misspelled, passed. So that's one typo. And then at the top of the fifth page, the second line, the first word should be the. <coughs> page five, typo. second line. Yep. The first word should be T H O U G H. And I have two minor things. Do you go ahead? I was going to, no, I'm sorry. Just... Okay. Um, on page two, um, in the minutes of the discussion of the utility roundup, um, there's a comment from David Turner regarding mm -hmm. nepotism on commissions, and I wasn't sure that that was part of the conversation of the utility roundup. I mean, it could stay there, but it didn't seem like it quite fit there. I, but I think that's, I'm not sure if that's where he needs to Maybe just when the comment was made? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys said no, that didn't count. Oh. <laughs> so that, that's next. Then I, I made it again the next time. 
Okay, and then there's a, a, another small typo at the bottom of page two, the last sentence that says announcer, gender announcer. That's one of my Oh, thanks. <coughs> okay, anything else on the minutes for March 5th? Okay, if not all entertain a motion. Uh, I approve. move that we approve the minutes as amended. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All right. So, uh, yes, Judith. You know, under announcements, I wondered if, we, if it would be uh, good again to uh, just make the announcement about Melissa's leaving because our last meeting was not a regular council meeting, and I just feel like it's an important uh, loss for the community, and so I just felt like that should be made note of in the announcements again. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, how did you want to? Um, yes. Unless Melissa wants to. Yes. Um, unfortunately, Melissa is leaving us. I'm happy for her, sad for us. She is um, leaving to become the city manager in Bellbrook, Ohio, um, which is not too far down the road. Um, I'm sure she will do the same amazing job for them that she has done for us, and we will miss her. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I, I feel like this is a terrible loss for our community. I'm really sorry to see you leave. Good luck, though. And, um, yeah, I just uh, feel like we've lost a very excellent staff member. And so I just wanted to be able to say that publicly. I, I would say, though, that I think, um, Melissa, you have really put our financial, our finances in good shape, both in terms of getting us from the place where we were in the red um, to also starting to uh, account for capital improvements and just getting things in much better shape. So thanks. And congratulations. Thank you. Yes, congratulations. Uh, you are going to be severely missed. Um, I think what I would add to what Marianna said is some of the things that you've tackled, I know we're celebrating tonight, the uh, the Army Corps of Engineers grant, finally getting that money after a decade. Um, and, uh, you know, getting the Safe Routes to School project back on board, just setting some things in motion that uh, I hope we're going to be able to continue. Thanks a lot. Okay, so a uh, review of the agenda. Anything that uh, we need to adjust? On tonight's agenda. I have a couple things. One is Tom Dietrich is going to be giving the annual report for the Environmental Commission and he has a class so I'm requesting that that report be moved to when we do the board reports because he can be there by then but he's not going to be able to be here by the time mm -hmm. that it's listed on the agenda. And I'd also like to include nominating him we, we uh, interviewed him, Lisa and I interviewed him for his second term, and he's been an amazing member of the Environmental Commission, so I'd like to nominate him again. We can do that, I think, at that same time we do the And lastly, we had a number <coughs> of uh, petitions and communications, and I just want to say it's going to might take one of the five minutes. <laughs> uh, anything else on the agenda? Um, included in the pack, I had an update to council about utility affordability. Um, I could uh, handle that, just mention it really quickly as part of old business. Okay. So you want to add that to old business? Thank you. And I also noticed that um, the Arts and Culture Commission has a, a budget request. So um, I think we normally add that to new business consider that okay all right so actually you know yeah. what I might I was going to just do it under boards and commissions but um, I, there's a a recommendation uh, JSTF is doing a kind of a new process for the, the next recommendation they're considering maybe I'll just say that under new business is a little earlier in the meeting people might hear it yeah. a little better so so this is the JF yeah, JFTS yeah, request for just a recommendation, yeah. Okay. Process. Okay. Um, so with that, petitions and communications. Take yeah. a deep breath. 
Yeah, okay. We had uh, a few online communications. One was from Doris Hubsman, <coughs> thanking the elected crew, in particular with Johnny, for a quick response. Uh, I suppose that was maybe an electric outage. Then we had a couple online communications from the Green County Public Health. One was in regard to uh, suicide prevention training from a mini grant, and I'm hopeful that that's also going to the police department, Josh. Uh, I don't know if you know whether the police got that communication about suicide prevention training. Mm, maybe. It, it, it seems like it would be good for that to get to the, the police department. And then they're also uh, they're having a 5K run walk on April 21st. And Hope Taft and the Green County Public Health made an announcement, made notice of groundwater appreciation week. Awareness. Awareness week. At any rate, there was an extensive report from Hope Pack about what groundwater is and why it's important. And <clears throat> it, I, I would really, I, it's so important. Perhaps the Yellow Springs News can get a copy of that. I'd be happy to give the news a copy of it because it was very educational in terms of how groundwater, where it is, what happens to it, and how dependent. Yellow Springs is, uh, the county also noted that almost one half of the Amer Americans use groundwater for their drinking water. Uh, uh, the Chamber also, Chamber of Commerce submitted their annual report and they also noted that they are having their Shred It Day on the April 21st. No. Yes, April 21st, Saturday at 9 to noon, the cor corner of Limestone and Quarry. And not only can you bring paper products, but you can also bring electronics and batteries, not car batteries, but small batteries to be recycled. Ellis Jacobs submitted some documents about different kinds of utility uh, assistance programs, and I think that that is going to fit nicely, Lisa, with the utility roundup, and we will refer that to them. Ellen Hoover uh, wrote a letter to council listing a number of concerns about infrastructure uh, as a result <coughs> of an accident that her husband had on our sidewalks, and I think that it's worth following up on, and Brian, I, I'll talk with you and Patty. I don't think we have followed up. Actually, I, I had, did send her an email today, but I think there's additional follow-up that should be done. Okay. Judith, you say you included something about old oh, yeah. bias training. Well, there's a conversation, and I think it, it's eventually it will come to the council table, but I know we're going to have a little meeting first. Um, Kevin uh, from council, um, you know, is, has been asking the village to look at, I mean, the whole council has been wanting to look at uh, implicit bias training. This was just one of the uh, possible options, and I did see that. Mark Heiss uh, submitted a letter in support of the street fair. <coughs> Rocket submitted a, a letter complain, complaining about the gas the sound coming out of the gas pump at Speedway. Uh, and uh, I'm not, I think that they toned it down, but. It, it, there really isn't a violation there, but um, we quietly asked them to turn it down. Yes. Yes. Quietly asked them. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet it down. Okay. Oh, and the last thing is. Uh, the announcement that's going to be going out, has started going out, about community conversations on housing. 
these are four events that are going to happen in April, and they're an opportunity for all the citizens to come. Hopefully one of the dates will work for you to find out more about the housing situation and to be able to talk with fellow citizens about your concerns about it and what we might want to be doing about it. So those dates are Wednesday, April 4th at 7 o'clock at the North Lawn School. We will, we haven't, we haven't uh, formally uh, gotten childcare for these events, but probably, hopefully, the Mills Lawn event, we would have childcare. Then the next day, uh, in the morning at 10.30 at the Senior Center, that would be Thursday, April 5th, there will be the same conversation. <coughs> Kevin uh, Magruder will be the presenter at each of these, present the PowerPoints, and the mediation program will be the facilitators. Then on Monday, April 9th at 6 o'clock at the Baptist Church will be the third community conversation on housing. And the last one for people who can't make any of the first three will be Saturday, April 21st at 2 p.m. in the Bryan Center, probably probably the room at 8 p.m. So we hope that as many people as possible can come to those events and that's it. Great. And uh, regarding child care, do you already have an avenue for no. that? So what we've done in the past is ask the high school um, because students have their community service hours. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks, Marianne. And uh, with that, we'll move into our legislation uh, <coughs> portion of the meeting. And the first resolution we have is approving council 2018 goals. And uh, Patty, are you going to read this one? Yeah. If you would like me to read the entire Great. Program. I would. If you don't mind, I'd love for you to read it in full. Whereas, Village Council adopts goals to guide decision making and resource allocation for the village, and whereas Village Council has publicly collaborated as to the aspirations, needs, and vision for the community, and whereas Village Council has diligently sought input from the community goal, the community and goal setting for 2018, now, now, therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that. Section 1, Council has identified the following values as the basis for their 2018 goals. Value 1, deepen decision-making processes with active citizen participation and effective representative governance. Value 2, be a model employer actively working to achieve diversity in hiring and employee retention and a provider of services within a responsible and sustainable fiscal framework. Value three, create a welcoming community of opportunity for all persons, regardless of race, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, economic status, ability, or religious affiliation. Value four, pursue a strong economy that provides diverse employment, creates a stable tax base, and supports community values, particularly affordability. Value five, seek in all decisions and actions to reduce the community's carbon footprint, encourage sound ecological practices, and provide careful, creative, and cooperative stewardship of land resources. Value six, intentionally promote anti-racism, inclusion, equity, and accessibility through all policies, procedures, and processes. Section two, the 2018 council goals as detailed in the attached exhibit A are hereby approved. Okay, thank you. I'll entertain a motion. Second. So, okay. Um, so uh, I'll begin. Uh, uh, with a brief discussion. We had a working session last Tuesday where we went through each goal in detail. Uh, there were some refinements that were discussed, but overall I think that uh, everyone felt that the goals, and particularly I think the focus should be on the 2018 actions were things that uh, made sense to focus on this year. And um, with that, would any other council members like to make any comments? No. Okay. Um, any questions or comments from citizens? And the last thing I'll emphasize is that uh, we understand the goals are a work in progress, so we will continue to refine them throughout the year. Uh, and we're going to be doing some work on prioritizing based on uh, what our staff's capacity is as well. So with that, uh, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All right. So uh, our next resolution is 2018-05.
and that is uh, amending our taser policy. And um, game for reading this one too. I, I, as long as you understand, I don't read as quickly as Judy. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's read it in full, please. Whereas, the village of Yellow Springs is a diverse community whose citizens are active in local governments, and whereas there has been great concern expressed on a national level regarding policing methods and training, and whereas the state of Ohio has created the Ohio Collaborative Community Police Advisory Board to advise and work with the Ohio Office of Criminal Justice Services for the purpose of defining statewide minimum standards for state and local law enforcement, including the proper use of force, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs and its residents are deeply concerned about policing methods and the potential impacts that they may have on all segments of the population, specifically on persons of color and persons with limited economic opportunity, and whereas the village of Yellow Springs has committed to the village guidelines for local policing to be used by the village in all matters related to policing, including policies, practices, and recruitment, and whereas the Justice System Task Force created by the, by the Yellow Springs Village Council has worked collaboratively with the Yellow Springs Police Department and the village manager, which included a review and consideration of national and Ohio policies pertaining to the use of tasers, and whereas the Justice System Task Force, the Yellow Springs Police Department, and the village manager hereby jointly recommend that the policy set forth in the attached Exhibit A to this resolution be adopted by Village Council. Now, therefore, be it resolved that Section 1, the Village of Yellow Springs Police Department shall immediately employ the taser policy hereto attached as Exhibit A as the official policy for taser deployment by any officer of the Village of, of the Yellow Springs Police Department. Section 2, this policy shall not be changed except by an official act of the Yellow Springs Village Council. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Second. Okay. Um, Sergeant Knapp, why don't you uh, leave this one off for us? So, just kind of give a little bit of a background of sort of what we, sort of how we got to the policy. Not by accident, we do everybody. Know, but I like it that way. Uh, so what we did, we worked together with the uh, Justice System Task Force to come up with a, a policy that not only addressed a lot of the concerns nationally uh, and locally with the uh, police use of force and the use of certain devices and weapons that police officers are uh, authorized to carry. Um, and we came up with something that, that was, uh, I think, a good fit for our agency, our community, um, and it's going to benefit, I think, everybody in terms of uh, keeping the citizens safe and, and the officers safe. So I think it's going to be a good way that we show that we're looking to be progressive and find ways that we can work together in the community. And then, any questions from the council? Does that sum it up, I guess. That sums it up well, Thanks, Sergeant. Thank you. Um, and, and I want to say, and I know Judith will probably have something to say as well, that I really appreciated this was a collaborative effort. Um, we had uh, community members such as Alice Jacobs involved in the discussion about what we needed in a taser policy for our village that would uh, conform with our guidelines for village policing. Um, Sergeant Knapp, uh, Chief Carlson, and the other officers were very engaged. We had support from our village solicitor. Patty was there as well. And uh, so it was a really good collaborative effort. Judith? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight some of the changes. And um, I think through this conversation we had, I mean, I think uh, uh, Chief Knapp and, uh, not Chief Knapp, sorry, here's Sergeant Knapp and Chief uh, Carlson um, had some concerns, you know, understanding, you know, what is it that we were, uh, the JSTF had looked at and had concerns about, and I think, so I think we learned some things about, you know, uh, we were a little bit uh, talking past each other initially in terms of um, uh, uh, conducted energy weapons, as they're called officially, um, they have reduced a lot of injuries. Now, a lot of us who are not in, the, in police work, we've seen where there's been injuries from them, which there can be, and they can they can hurt people. Um, but they also, in the larger context, can be a way to uh, to uh, address a dangerous situation in a less than lethal way. So, um, so, so the first thing that um, we did was we added some language. So we're starting with Alexa Pole, which is a national um, police 
policy uh, maker, I don't know what to call it, uh, uh, consulting firm. They, they developed policies for police departments, and our police department decided to use it because our policies were a hodgepodge of policies from a lot of different uh, police departments. And it was in great need of bringing some order to it. And um, the sergeants with the chief uh, saw this as a good way to do it. And I think um, there's this effort in the state of Ohio, it's, it's coming from the Attorney General's office, um, called the Ohio Collaborative, which is trying to professionalize policing and sort of make things more standardized. Is that right? Okay. And um, so some of the um, things that we, on the other hand, uh, we wanted to, we felt like it was important, I mean, Lexapol isn't necessarily perfect, their policies. Uh, some of those, some of the policies we need to look at, and um, we want to also be able to make certain kind, to make adjustments, and in fact, when we looked at kind of the national conversation about Lexapol police, po police policy, uh, there's, there's the idea out there that there is room for, um, uh, editing and, and shaping it towards values of different communities. Um, the first thing, you know, when we talked about the policy that we, we changed the language um, in was um, we said the conducted energy weapon is intended to protect against persons who pose an immediate threat. Um, while the appro now I'm skipping a little bit here. While the appropriate use of such a di uh, such a device should result in pure serious injuries to officers and suspects, so that's sort of acknowledging the fact that yes, that it should it actually can be safer. Uh, CEUWs are potentially lethal devices uh, when used on vulnerable populations or not within the proper protocol. So a lot of when we see these national incidents, you know, someone's been taste ten times in a row and they end up dying. You know, this is not within proper protocols. We wanted to emphasize that though they can make things safer, they can they also are potentially lethal. And we want our police officers to be aware of that. We want to make that statement right up front. Um, another thing I wanted to point to people's attention um, is that tasers are not to be used solely to gain compliance. Uh, so that's, you know, they're, they're, expect, they're expected to be used in a situation where there is, you know, a, a perceived danger. So, for example, it says now in the policy, mere flight from pursuing officer is not a reason to use a taser. If there isn't a danger to anyone, if there's not anything really dangerous, somebody you know, some minor violation, they end up running, that's not a reason to chase someone. So we wanted to get at the um, the fact that, you know, if you perceive them as not legal, um, and then just using them for compliance, I mean, we need to acknowledge they are dangerous, so we don't want to be using uh, them in circumstances where it's not, it's just, they're a minor, something minor is going on, and um, we don't want our police officers using them in that way. Um, and uh, the police department was very com was comfortable with that. Um, and one thing that we added in, um, oh, and then for example, it talks about you know, again, if you use it more, if there was a reason to use it, there's, uh, it says officers should generally not intentionally apply more than one conducted energy weapon. Uh, on what on at a time against a single subject. So again, again, they need to be used with thoughtfulness, and um, again, they can pose a danger to someone's health, especially when they are being repeatedly used. Um, it talks. There's also a section in here about people who are, um, you know, particularly um, at risk in the use of tasers that you really. Um, uh, and for example, it talks about a pregnant woman. Um, we, there needs to be care for people under the influence of substances, a uh, person who appears to be in need of medical attention, um, the, the sensitive areas that you want to tr avoid trying to hit with the taser if you are using it. And then after a person has been tased, they need to be seen uh, to make sure, you know, by. Let's just say it here. All persons who have been struck um, shall be medically assessed prior to booking. So we want to be looking out for the 
uh, that something uh, that would hurt that person's health is not going to happen should it need to be used. Um, and I know uh, that was added on was a, a section just about these situations where, where people have uh, just the uh, circumstances where there's been a real negative impact on the health of people who have been tased. Again, we want to just make our, it is a tool for police officers. It is generally less than a lethal tool, um, and people recover fairly quickly and often are not, you know, injured from them. But we don't, uh, so we want, it's kind of that balance of understanding of their use. And I, I'm very pleased with the changes. Me too. All right. Did I explain that well enough? <laughs> um, so, uh, nothing else for me, Patty. Did you want to add anything? No, just that I, I thought that we all worked together very well to, to come up with this. As, as Judith said, there was a little bit of uh, disconnect in the beginning, but we sat down at the table and said, well, this is how we read this. And, and of course, the other side was like, well, that's not how we're reading it. And, uh, <laughs> So at the end of the day, we came up with what everyone agrees is a good policy. Any questions or comments from citizens? All right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay. One more piece of legislation tonight is Ordinance 2018-06. And um, Patty, would you please read that one? I think we should read it in full as well so we understand it. Do I take a motion? Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. I move that we adopt Ordinance 2018. Okay. Second. All right. Mm -hmm. Adding a new section 1040.12 uh, to <coughs> Article 4 Public Utilities establish a continuity of service clause for village utilities. Whereas the Village of Yellow Springs provides utilities which include electric, water, sewer, and garbage services for all residents and businesses eligible for said services within the village. And whereas the Village of Yellow Springs is committed to providing continuous, reliable utility services. And whereas it is recognized that at times there may be unpreventable natural occurrences or accidents which may interrupt any of our utility services. services. Now therefore, Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio hereby ordains that. Section 1. A new Section 1040.12 establishing a continuity of service clause for the Village of Yellow Springs of, of the codified ordinances of the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio is hereby enacted to read as set forth in Exhibit A, which is attached here to and incorporated herein. Section 2. This ordinance shall take effect and be in full force at the earliest date permitted by law. Okay. Melissa? Okay, so this ordinance is actually just one of those loose end ordinances that I wanted to get in front of council before I left because it's important. Um, all, all utility providers have a continuity of service clause such as this within their ordinances and policies and all this is doing is just saying that the village is going to um, do everything that it can to supply service and that at some points there, there there could be outages due to natural occurrences or accidents and that we are not responsible for those essentially. So it covers all of our utilities as well. Okay. Um, any questions or comments from council? Um, and uh, since this is the first reading, uh, I'm not going to open a public hearing unless there are any comments or questions from uh, citizens. We can vote on it next time when that is here. Okay. So uh, we're now going to move into citizen <coughs> concerns. And um, this is the time on the agenda when we will entertain any comments about things that are not items on the agenda. And we ask that you limit your uh, uh, comments to three minutes. So do we have any citizen concerns? Okay, then we're on to special reports, and I believe uh, Saul Greenberg, Economic Sustainability Commission, you are listed first. Thank you. Okay, um, do people have copies of this? Yeah, they're out on the table. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize the uh, uh, report from the Economic Sustainability Commission, and basically we'll first talk about the membership, and there have been uh, some changes in membership. Uh, does this up this year um, and it's sort of resulted in some oh, greater energy and efficiency we now have uh, 
two former council members. As members of the commission, we have representation <laughs> from the village of Yellow Springs School System. And we have um, all members of the commission right now who are very actively involved. And it took a little bit of shuffling and people who are on their initial commission discovering what, just how much time and commitment it needed from them themselves. So I think we've gone from re-implemented a little over two years ago, maybe, to reinvigorate. Uh, because uh, we're at a point now where I think we're ready to function with more power and efficiency and more meaningfulness. One of the first items um, that has come up in terms of uh, something that's solid enough to give some summarization about is the revolving loan fund. The commission spent quite a bit of time and that time was spread out over a period of time with some other things coming into play. Meanwhile, um, talking about developing the revolving loan fund and then eventually being able to pass it on to council, which then led to a topic which is on our goals for next year, so I'm skipping ahead a tiny bit in this report, but it's tied together, which has to do with a designated CIC. Because one of the primary issues and problems that came out of the discussion about the revolving loan fund was the fiscal management of those funds themselves. How would they be dispersed? How would they be followed? How would they be, would be audited? What sort of um, liabilities would a person applying for that uh, fund or funds be subject to and, uh, and under what sort of governance would that come? That led to the discussion about a designated CIC. So the revolving Denzel, do you want to share with folks what a CIC is? What that uh, well, for? I'm going to learn a lot more about it in just a few weeks. Well, so uh, I just meant uh, corporate, I mean, community improvement corporation. Yeah. Yes. So a designated community yeah, CI improvement corporation. Yep. Yeah. Which will dedicate most of our next meeting to studying and understanding and being able to determine uh, whether or not we can do more with it and what we can do and uh, what we would feel that would be meaningful um, for the commission to take up, to put it really simply. Um, so the revolving loan fund really led to some other really potentially meaningful business that is going to be ongoing. Um, another uh, very uh, significant piece of business that came to the uh, commission um, was dealing with the Center for Business and Education because during this period of time the land was deeded over to the village and the commission was asked to do some work around uh, finding out what people in the village had in terms of ideas for the utilization of that land and we held a couple of community forums. We made a report here and um, we did a survey uh, through several different means and came up with some uh, really good ideas from citizens in terms of input. And then subsequent to that, Cresco approached the village and uh, the commission itself didn't have a whole lot to do with that, but it positions the commission uh, in such a way that we can also, this uh, is anticipating an item that is a goal for this coming year of the commission, to consider some more ideas about what can be done with the remainder of that land, or should be done in consideration thereof, uh, particularly right now for the commission in terms of marketing and considering any plans going forward. So, even though we kind of diverted our attention from working on some other things to the CBE, um, it was a worthwhile endeavor, and once again, it folds into what we're doing in terms of going forward. Um, another topic that came up uh, to the commission relatively more recently um, came out of a conference that Community Solutions held in which uh, people here 
<coughs> sessions by Michael Schumann, which led to the idea of localization and what that could mean for Yellow Springs. There's been an ad hoc group uh, independent of council, um, which is being attended by some council members. Uh, myself also um, as a community meeting representative and representative of the community of solutions and people representing the Morgan Family Foundation and the Yellow Springs Foundation as well as the Yellow Springs Credit Union uh, in terms of looking at bringing Michael Schumann to town or perhaps communicating with them uh, electronically to, to examining uh, ideas around localization is pretty free floating right now, but uh, Sandy Homberg from the Credit Union submitted a proposal to the National Credit Union Association for some money to go toward the expenses for our consultation with Michael Schumann, and we should hear very shortly whether or not that proposal is accepted. Um, it's been very favorably looked upon by the body who receives that. Proposal. And then it's still very much in the brainstorming stage that there aren't any specific propositions coming out of that yet. Um, so these all lead to the, uh, specifics, specifics for uh, goals for 2018. Uh, before I restate what some of those are, we also listed um, guests that came to the Sustainability Commission and the citizens concerns uh, aspect. And if you have a moment to read those, I think you'll see that it's been a very interesting and stimulating mix. And sometimes it leads to further business and sometimes it's just uh, interesting and important. Uh, we don't know what will happen with any of those uh, items that the guests brought forward. But specifically for goals for 2018, we're still working on completing an incentive policy, uh, which I think is pretty much... It's in the packet. Okay, so... <laughs> okay, so council gets our recommendations for an incentive policy, which is one of the items of business that we've been working on off and on over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, goal number two, explore the capacity of the EEC <coughs> to advise and assist council on the formation of the designated community improvement corporation for the village of Yellow Springs. Notice the word explore the capacity. <laughs> That's because we're very much in the learning stage and most of the conversations we've had so far is what is it? And we, uh, we have several ideas and impressions and now we have some materials. We'll have an invited speaker to our next meeting and we hope to know a whole lot more and move uh, to a more specific place than just exploring the capacity phrase. Um, goal number three, engage with the localization efforts to provide support as able. Again, that's pretty much in a brainstorming stage, so we're saying we're qualifying what we're saying as a goal because we're saying as able. We don't really know yet, but council is a part of those ad hoc discussions. So that will come to more definition, hopefully, also soon. And goal number four, I already mentioned, identify an attraction and marketing strategy for the CBE as directed by council. And that's pretty much it. Questions? Thank you, Saul. Um, I just have a couple of comments. Uh, one, Michael Schumann was here a few years ago. <laughs> okay, just one year. People remember that. It's kind of how we got. Oh, is that? Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure. I hadn't heard the reference to it, so I don't know if people right. remember. I mean, it was many years ago. He did the day workshop uh, at the grade school, I think. Right. And um, but the other thing is, in terms of the qualifying criteria, something council's talking about is implementing something that is known out there in the world as diversity hiring practices. And I wondered if we would want to, one thing I, I have thought as the village uh, puts into place diversity hiring practices for the village, um, I had thought it would be great if we could be encouraging other 
institutions, nonprofits, for-profit uh, businesses, that they would also implement these hiring practices. And um, so I just wondering about adding that once. Um, I think you're referring to the incentive policy. Yes. And I, I think that um, Saul had just been highlighting the annual report and hadn't done any overview comments at all about the incentive policy yet. But yes, so those are, those are good recommendations. I, I, yep. I think we have other probably comments about that it's separate. When you get to that item. Sorry about that. Right. Oh, no, it's good. <laughs> I was looking ahead. <laughs> I was looking at the incentive policy. Yeah, sorry well, about that. Well, I actually have, uh, are we, is there a plan to talk about this? Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, we were meeting? thinking it would be a no, future agenda item. Okay. okay. Yeah, so. I, there's maybe a couple of, of comments that could be made, and then we can bring it back. Just very short. From sure. whom? Well, I, I could, or, or maybe Karen could. I. I'm glad to know if, if we're ready to go to that. I guess I, I just, given that um, HRC provides small grants, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure why this is called an incentive policy, but it seems like primarily it's about the grants, so I'm not sure that it is or not. But I would suggest <coughs> that if something like this is going to be done, that we look at sort of broadly ways that uh, the village contributes in kind or money to the various things that we contribute to hmm. as this is being, as, as <laughs> we're doing. Thank you about this. Okay. So Lisa, did you want to make a few comments about it before we wrap um, this piece up? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's my understanding that, that this commission has been working on an incentive policy for some time. I think it's an interesting idea to understand how various types of incentives and monies for different purposes might fit together. Um, but the purpose of, of this policy specifically is to encourage investment in both for-profit and non-profit um, uh, businesses that can improve the quality of life in the village. And uh, the commission, I think, has done an excellent job in aligning this with village values and, and then both identifying quality uh, qualifying criteria um, that that really focus on um, the merit and capacity of an organization who might get an incentive to make the best use of it. Um, and then there's a process and then there's actually an application included. And the idea of including the application is to kind of bring it more specifically to life. What kinds of questions would be asked? Um, what kind of information would we need? I think some of the open issues that we would, um, the commission would value as feedback um, from from council have to do with not only the sufficiency of the of of the document, but also then who's going to make these decisions, and if it's, is it part of the DCIC or is the commission going to have some role? I think that's an area that we will definitely want to put from council. And I just want to add, uh, you know, what started this uh, initiative was the idea that we should not be ad hoc <coughs> in these decisions, but that we should have a consistent approach and be transparent. And um, and yeah, I really appreciate uh, the commission tackling this. It's an excellent document, and it will be on um, probably our next agenda. Um, Saul, thanks for your leadership as chair. And um, I'm now going to have actually our new chair of the Arts and Culture Commission, Brittany Baum, come up and uh, tell us what the Arts and Culture Commission did last year. Hi, everyone. I'm Brittany Baum. Um, our current members are John Fleming, Catherine Roma, Nancy Mellon, Kathy Moulton, Lisa Krieger, and Brian Hausch. <coughs> um, we covered about five different things, uh, four of them last year. The first was the Village Inspiration and Design Award, or the VITA. Um, the goal of that is to recognize the value of public art in our community, which drives economic development and enhances quality of life. This was awarded to House of Ohm in 2017 for their important contributions to the village. Um, the second uh, item on the annual report is the John Bryan Community Gallery. Um, it was since 2012 that art was up in the hallways. Um, last year was the first year in five years that we have art back up in the hallways here at the building. The first um, 
the first exhibit was Erin Smith, who is a local artist in the area. Um, once her artwork, or once her exhibit ended, we worked directly with the Yellow Springs Art Council to create a, home, a permanent home for their permanent collection. Um, as you can see right now in the hallways, we have the banner exhibit up right now. That will run through June 30th. Um, and the goal of this partnership is just to highlight the importance of art in our community. So we're looking to host <coughs> several exhibits throughout every year. The third area was uh, public arts and culture projects. One of our um, important projects was the kindness, or were the kindness banners that were um, placed up. Um, a lot of people probably saw from uh, social media, there was a lot of uh, feedback on these banners. Um, the goal was to recognize the importance of being kind and highlighting the village values of being a welcoming community. These banners are installed throughout the year in between different events. Um, we're hoping that they will go up on Good Friday and they'll remain up until an upcoming event is, is coming up that we can highlight and then we're hoping that they'll go back up in between events. Uh, we also partnered with various organizations to promote public art and culture in YS. Um, we met with members of the Arts Council in Mills Lawn Elementary School to discuss various upcoming projects. Um, one of their goals is to raise money for the Wheel and Golf uh, Sculpture Project. These meetings and partnerships are planned to continue throughout 2018. Our goals for 2018 are to continue to administer the VETA Award, to promote visibility of the African American experience in Yellow Springs throughout exhibits and experiences of the arts. Um, one of those is the Gong Statue Project and ongoing communication through liaisons with the 365 Project. Our third goal is to facilitate the ongoing success of the John Bryan Community Gallery through collaboration with the Yellow Springs Art Council. Um, we're also working on the, uh, the Hidden Figures acquisition. Excuse me, acquisition. Uh, currently, this is being shown at the Mills Lawn Elementary School, and we're working with the Arts Council on um, perhaps creating a second set that can either live at um, live as live at the Arts Council or have some other home within um, Yellow Springs. Our fourth goal is to revisit and update the mission statement and vision statement of the Arts and Cultural Commission to postulate advocacy across the spectrum of art activities and experiences. We'd like to review the Commission's understanding of public art, review our overall meaning of arts and culture, and promote a bridge to the arts for village staff community members. Um, the final item we have is the budget request for 2018. I don't know if you want to talk about that now or if that's new business. Um, <clears throat> why don't you uh, make a few comments since we're going to be talking about it later just to tee that up. Um, our total request is $5,000. 500 of it would be spent towards the Village Inspiration and Design Award. That's through education, materials, and special events. 1,000 is requested towards the John Bryan Community Center Gallery. That's also for education, materials, and special events. And then the last chunk for 3,500 is for community sponsorships. For example, the art cans, skate park reception, and kindness manners are all examples of past items. Um, some of our future ideas are the Wheel and Golf Project, the Banner Festival, a World Music Day, artistic wayfinding signage. We're hoping to maybe work with collaboration with the chamber on that. And then also a high school art mural. That's the, that's all I have for you guys tonight. All right. Thanks, Brittany. Thank you. Any, Any questions? Yeah. I just wanted to say to both of the commissions, um, the work of the commissions is incredible. I mean, what you guys are getting done, uh, it's, I mean, it's a big, increase in activity and really doing great things for the village so really appreciate it thanks, thanks everyone all right appreciate it okay um so we are now going to move into old business 
and uh, Marianne, I believe uh, we've got a housing. I'm oh, sorry, what you know? Are we going to do yeah. the budget discussion? I thought we added that to or the It's under new business. It's under new business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's. Yeah, we're uh, on old business. Sorry. Now. Okay. All right, I'm going to revoke your deputy privilege. Hey, that's not <laughs> All right, thanks, Dave. Thanks for coming. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Um, so, housing, and this yeah, great commissions. All right. Housing update. Yeah. Um, I submitted a written report about what the um, Housing Advisory Board has been doing. And, um, Basically, there are two areas of focus. The, the primary one right now is getting ready to have the conversations on housing in April. The other activity that we have been doing is outreach to people who work in the area of mixed income housing and talk to four people around the country who do this work and we're collecting recommendations that they've given us that include such things as strategies that might work, might work in Yellow Springs, as well as other resources that we can pack in to. And so I think that really that's all that I have to say right now, unless anyone on council has any questions, comments, or anyone in the um, I guess I wondered. We had we started this conversation at the uh, goals, uh, where you know Brian brought up uh, the you know the focus at the glass farm and how we balance that you know uh, with you know other potential developmental opportunities in the village and. Um, so I guess I just had the question about, I think there was the question about the, the planning for the, um, for, for the PowerPoint and presentation on housing needs assessment, I think is really good. And, um, and the PowerPoint is very good, I think. But, and Karen did a lot of great editing on it, which was very excellent. Um, but I did wonder, there is, you know, it does focus, the, you know, the one slide does focus at sort of starting to think about the glass farm. And I guess the question is, you know, is that, is, I mean, I guess I just wondered well, if the council, I just wondered where council, how council thought that should fit in. So I, I guess I, I've been questioning myself, I'm not quite sure. What I'd like to say, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves in terms of what, what we're talking about at council. And I, anticipate that our that our next uh, advisory committee board we're going i want to have a discussion of how do we how do we when do we reach out to potential other developers how do we do that <coughs> who's going to do it and i'd rather keep that at the uh, advisory board level now i do think it's appro appropriate i mean hopefully everyone knows that the village owns the glass farm where it is and that it uh, has been uh, considered for housing development for a number of years. It's in our, I think, our comp plan and vision for that. And I think it's totally appropriate that it's listed in the PowerPoint. Oh, it's not that it should be listed in the PowerPoint. It's just, I just wondered what the balance was in terms of the focus on that. <coughs> it had been raised, and I'm a little bit myself with the phone. I don't think there's a problem. Um, do you want to talk about what you added to the housing goal related to this? Well, the housing goal has a number of action steps for 2018. Those action steps include, along <coughs> with doing the community conversations on housing, develop, developing a vision for what we want Yellow Springs to be in terms of housing, who, who do we want to be able to house? Secondly, creating concrete goals in terms of what kind of housing, how much housing of these different types we would need in the next five to ten years to meet, to meet that vision. Uh, then the third piece would be strategies to meet that vision. And those strategies include, of course, 
We have the glass file on which we can build housing. It also includes working with developers and potential developers, landowners who are interested in developing uh, their land, uh, infill, various types of infill strategies and encouragement, uh, and then direct funding for home development and home buyers, um, private public partnerships. Th those are the kind of strategies. Now, when we do those strategies, what we do, how we do them, that is all, we're, we're just in the process of talking to people, we'll be talking to other communities that have done this, so that we can try to create an effective plan to, to do what we want to do. And this, we're at the 80 steps of that right now. So I, I don't know, I don't think there's a lot more talk, <coughs> talking about some of this. Yeah, and I, I just wanted to highlight, because there was the addition um, to, I'll just read it out, seek ways to collaborate with stakeholders to support inclusive housing on privately owned properties. Yeah. Um, so that was one area I know where uh, we're sort of addressing that. Um, we've got an opportunity with Glass Farm, but we've got these other opportunities that um, I mean, I think Pat recognizes. Yeah, and, and we, I don't think it's appropriate for us to start talking about too much about potential opportunities on private property until we've actually had some conversations with private property owners. So that's why I'm, I'm hesitant to, to get very involved in that conversation. All right. Um, any other questions or comments? Comments from citizens? All right. So, uh, Patty, I think the uh, next one is you. Fees for services related to events. Uh, yes. Um, a while back, and, and I believe it was Marianne who asked um, for us to bring this information back. Um, we had previously brought some information to council, we being the staff, um, regarding the um, fees that we're charging for events, various events that village personnel spend time uh, time or use equipment on, that kind of thing. This is a brief list of the um, some of the events, most of the events that we hold. There are some new ones that aren't on that particular list, such as um, Springs Fest and a couple of other things. These, this is generally what we spend for each of those events. Um, and in addition, the electric department consistently hangs banners for a number of different entities and events throughout the village. Um, you can see there what that costs us as far as manpower and equipment use. Um, and then the small banners, we have to actually rent a lift because it's so much easier than trying to get the <coughs> bucket truck up and down the, the uh, streets to do the uh, smaller banners. In addition, we were asked to make some recommendations for potential charges uh, for these events, and those are attached <coughs> in the report for you to see. Well, I'll, I'll say something. Yep. Um, <coughs> staff brought this to council a year or so ago. Back in 15, actually. And I don't remember the impetus initially for it, but it's mm -hmm. just sort of languished there. And I did request that it be brought back to council because I think it's part of, as we're looking at where we spend our money and where we bring in income, it makes sense to look at how the village government supports various community events. So clearly the, the biggest thing and uh, is the street fair event, which is considerably more investment than any of the others. I guess the next one would be the, the zombie walk. But I was interested in seeing that incentive policy, that incentive policy, because it occurred to me that there may be some of these events that we explicitly say, okay, the village is going to support this. We're not going to request any money for it. But I think we need to be explicit and not just make the assumption that any community event 
the, the village will support it and not either ask to be reimbursed or at least request a uh, a um, request for financial support for doing that event. So, so I did have one question, Patty, which was you said your recommendation the staff recommendation was that $25 an hour be charged for any uh, event that costs over $200? $25 an hour for staff time. So $25 an hour per person per hour for the time you spend. So would and that translate to any of these things like, uh, let's say, the, the zombie walk, which costs roughly $800? Mm -hmm. Does that mean <clears throat> that, that, that means that the other $591 worth they would be asked to um, reimburse us. So that the so first $200 would be forgiven. Okay. <coughs> okay, I guess I'd like, I would like to hear a little bit. Wait, they would be read, they would pay the $500 and some, or they would pay $20 an hour, $25 an hour. It, it would be whatever, it, what you would do is, if the event costs $700, the first $200 are not chargeable, okay, whatever that is. After that, it's however much time we put into it at $25 an hour. This doesn't include anything in the, like equipment wear and tear or anything like that. It doesn't include so it's, not, okay. it's strictly the man hours that we, we would put into it. I mean, the only thing I think about that is, is the smaller events, um, which, you know, so to be fair, would also be $25 an hour? Yeah, uh, all the events would be the same. Uh -huh. the, everybody would be forgiven the first $200, and then after that it would be $25 an hour for whatever manpower over the $200 that the village has to put in. Um, the only difference is that it would the there was the as you can see the last comment there was a a discussion among staff as to whether or not to charge for the police department time because it's considered safety by some but others said but it has a budget impact so there wasn't really a clear consensus of consensus on staff about the PD's time so the, the twenty five dollars an hour as it stands would be electric water, streets, you know, those crews. Um, and then council would make the decision as to which department. The, the aspect that popped out to me the most was the police department question too. And I, I found myself um, not, you know, it was one of those things where I was like, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know. I, I wondered if there's precedent of other communities that have, you know, large events that that create spikes in in population density and how that's handled typically. We, we did a survey back in 2015 um, when we brought this, and it was about 50-50. Some some communities support all of the events with no reimbursement. Other communities ask for reimbursement in different levels, and it was about 50-50. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, there's really there's no there's no good answer because it is public safety but at the same time the police department budget is frequently a point of contention and is the like overtime like police overtime cost bundled into these the 25 dollars an hour is a straight time cost for everyone it's we averaged all of the crew costs the crew salaries and it comes out to an average of 25 dollars an hour we would not charge an overtime rate i see so if there are ten off, if there are ten staff members involved, we're charging twenty-five dollars an hour times ten. And if there's one off, uh, staff member, it's twenty-five dollars times one. Is yeah. that correct? Mm -hmm. For every hour, yeah. For every hour. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, on most of these events, is the cost primarily the police department? Um, on most of these events, the cost is primarily um, electric and streets. Um, the electric is putting up the extra panels and things. Um, snow fencing for some of the events to, because they have um, um, beer gardens or whatever. Um, there are some that include the police like the 4th of July. 
Um, I know the PD uses on duty officers for some of the 5K, like the Simply Women and all of that. Um, for the MLK march, um, that's an on duty officer. And again, anything that's less than $200 they wouldn't be charged for anyway because we're probably using the on-duty people who don't, you know, that are available. The, prob the problem is that um, if you, you know, some of these events it takes a couple, three days to set up for, so that means they don't get anything else done during that time. Really. Did you figure out <laughs> approximately what that would mean for the events that are more than $200? I mean, like cost-wise? Well, I, mean, I don't. I don't know how many uh, uh, staff are working on street fair versus zombie walk versus. Well, the the costs that you see there include the uh, the estimated staff time. So, they, so, so it sort of is already. Yeah. Uh, uh, Twenty five hundred dollars or yeah. and then these these numbers are staff time. These numbers got, don't include the anything else. Oh, okay. Well, I, I think one thing that's important to highlight in this discussion is why when we did the research before we found that many communities do support these events um, because they do support local businesses, uh, they support nonprofits, they, uh, like Mark Heiss's letter highlighted, you know, they, they market our village um, and make it a place that, uh, you know, people are interested in, in uh, exploring and potentially living. Um, so. You know, I, I think that we do need to, you know, think about why. Um, I think most communities think it makes sense to support events on some level. Um, I do agree with one thing, Marianne, that you said though is um, we want to be transparent about all the things that we do, and you know, so I, I think that piece is something that um, I definitely think we should explore. But I also believe we have a couple people here in the audience that might want to speak. And so maybe we'll hear from citizens and then bring it back to us. Yeah. I, I would just yeah. like to say something. Yes. Yeah. Clearly, the village supports a lot of economic development sort of things, as well as community development things. And I don't have, I mean, I think that that's appropriate. I mean, the, an example is the pool. The pool loses money. We support it because it's good for the community. What I do think, I didn't, I wasn't thinking transparent as much as explicit. So if we're going to let the zombie walk not pay any money, for example, then we should be explicit that, that it's costing us eight, approximately $800 to do that. And, and I don't have a problem charging for some of these events and I also think it makes sense to have a mechanism so that people can apply for the village and we have to have criteria and that incentive policy might be the way to do it of, of an event someone that's doing an event applies to the village and say this is what we're going to do and we would like the village to subsidize us at you know, a certain amount and clearly we're not going to solve it tonight but I think both of we need to be looking at both of those things. If the village says yes, we will subsidize this event to a certain amount, and we <coughs> want you to submit some documentation about why we should do it. And and the village can say, okay, we'll do it, and we'll also charge a certain amount. And the eighteen thousand for street fairs for both of them? Yes. Is that so does it make it thirty six thousand? No, no, no. Oh, okay, no, it's a total. Total. Oh, okay. Okay. So, uh, any comments, Chairman <coughs> Metro? Hi guys, Hi. Um, Karen Wintrow, I'm the Executive Director of the Yellow Springs Chamber and certainly uh, Street Fair is our big event, um, it's our big fundraiser of the year, but uh, we really support all of these events. About 10 years ago when I became director of the chamber, one of the things we identified as a strategy we could use to attract people to town to shop at our shops and meet at our restaurants was to have events that people like to have something to do. So we, we had the Yellow Springs experience. I mean, we talk about the Yellow Springs experience, that you come, you hike in the Glen, you go to the Arts Council gallery meetings. 
you shop in the shops, you go to the restaurants, you go to the brewery. It really is about an experience and offering things, people a day-long activity. So that's why these events are so important. And what they do for the community organizations are beyond, I mean, for us, obviously street fair is our, is our largest money maker. Um, it, we essentially couldn't exist without street fair as an organization. Um, it allows us to employ a staff person, and that is, is probably 75 to 80% of her job is doing street fair. But we support all of these events um, for the reason of attracting people. Um, Springs Fest is another a great new event. We're going into our third year. I don't know if you saw. We're bringing Guided by Voices, which is a nationally recognized group. They happen to be local. They happen to be Dayton-based, but they're a national group. Um, so the folks, those that concert promoter, Connor Stratton, is a local kid. He's doing this. He's investing money. There's, there's going to be money invested in that. The chamber invests more than $75,000 in street fare. Um, we provide buses, we provide transportation, we provide, um, we're actually going to be adding police uh, service this year um, to, to have more people, and we're paying for that, working with, with Chief Carlson to pay for that. Signage to make, to make it getting around easier, the trash, the, the uh, portage-ons, the dumpsters, so much of that we also paid for. So, so there really is a lot. Um, and, and what, you know, 20,000 nonprofits, I mean, just a, a, a quick uh, a survey that I've done of the nonprofits, they're making $20,000 a year at Street Fair. I can guarantee you that there is not another way that those nonprofits, the, the PTO and the Boy Scouts make 5,000. There is not another way that they're going to replace that that amount of money. It is by virtue of the fact that there are so many people in town for one day. They arrive, they leave. It is. It's pretty crazy when they're here, but they're gone by seven o'clock. You don't even know they were there. And I do want to say that I do have a list of um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven events. Um, and that we did the research. Events that I would consider closest to street fair in size and scope and importance to the communities, Torrey Strawberry Festival, Centerville Americana Festival, um, Sauerkraut, Bellbrook, Sugar Maple, Fairborn Halloween Fest, and those communities support them all. Um, there, is, there are no fees paid. Um, I, think, I think with Strawberry Fest, um, they recently did um, require they expanded it hugely. The bill went over $50,000. Troy is supporting Strawberry Fest for $50,000, and that's just one event that they're supporting. So um, there's a lot more to say. Um, actually, I do think Jerry Deers, one of our board members, did want to make some comments about some communities that don't support events. Could I ask you? Sure. I have a couple questions. Um, you said that the chamber supports some of these events, I guess, that are listed? Oh, well, I mean, we advertise for them, and, and we, yeah, we do. I mean, we do. Mostly it's in advertising. Springs Fest, we're, we're a sponsor. We, we do the beer garden. For us, it's a fundraiser, but it's also, um, we also do a lot of promotional support of that. And the other question was, you said you, you the chamber itself spends... <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> oh, there you, go. Um, you spend $75,000 a year on street fair. On street fair. And that doesn't include our staff person. That doesn't include her salary. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Good evening, everyone. My name is Jerry Deer, and as Karen said, I am a newly elected member of the Chamber Board. But I came to speak to you from a couple of different reasons. Um, have any of you been through Jamestown recently? What's left of it? One of the things that's really interesting about small towns like ours is that when the town itself stops supporting things in different ways, and obviously you do not do that. You're wonderful supporters of the business community here and the community in, in itself, or I wouldn't be a part of the chamber and a part of the community here. But I can tell you that in my experience over the years, I've worked with a lot of events and activities 
all of the Midwest, and every time I have seen, um, not just financially, but also just a community support of events that are like the largest, the major event that draw people to the town. When that starts to deteriorate, the town starts to deteriorate. A lot of them have lost their, their infrastructure, they've lost their industry. Some of them only depend on these things to just bring people back in. And I mentioned Jamestown because that's where I grew up. And when I was there, it was like living in Mayberry. We had everything. We had the soda fountain, we had all that, but we had the, the uh, Lions Club Festival, the Bean Festival, which is called now. And if you go to that in September, what you're going to see is a very sad image of what it used to be. And it's because the village and the, and the Lions Club and the township just don't talk to each other. They don't make it work like it used to. They don't support it like they used to. And the people don't want to come back. So it makes it a very sad way to watch your, when you grow up there and you're still there, and you watch it kind of deteriorate. Now one festival is not going to do that, obviously. We lost a lot of other things. But it does help when we know that festivals like this are, I mean, especially when you think about the street fair being one day. And we've got festivals around here that go three, four days and probably don't generate as much interest by percentage as our street fair does here. And it's interesting because I, I think that the businesses here all benefit. I think the community benefits. It gives people a reason to come here. We have a lot of great things. We have the bike path. We have all these wonderful things. But I think that's a huge part of keeping the community active and keeping the community from becoming things like, uh, like Jamestown and like Greenville. Did you ever hear of the Annie Oakley Festival? That's because it's this big. But it used to be, for almost 40 years, was one of the largest festivals in the state. And it was an amazing thing until there was a split, and they just stopped supporting it, stopped caring, and it kind of dried up and went away. So I just wanted, from an outsider's perspective that cares about this community, I just wanted to put that past you. Questions? I don't know who you are, so I'm just wondering what you're kind of involved with the chamber. <laughs> well, I actually just left my position with DMS Inc., you know who DMS is, right? um, as their communications director. And I have my two businesses in the chamber here as well. So I got very active very quickly. <laughs> but I grew up around here and I grew up in Yellow Springs, so I know it very well. Anything else? All right. Thanks, Jared. Uh, any other comments? I just have one more quick question. So these numbers here, Patty, does that um, this includes the police time, the not the list here? But you're suggesting that what people would pay would not include police time. That's correct. Okay. So. Only because when we did them originally, everybody we included everybody. So if we work to charge the police time and we were to charge or at least account for the cost these fees would be less well but you have to but you have to very much yes they would be less but not really very much because most of these as you can see things like installing temporary electric poles dropping barricades putting up snow fencing <coughs> the police department doesn't do that that is the truth so while there is probably some small amount of police and safety in there um, for a couple of these. It is not the primary cost of the events. And that's true of the street fair too. There's not extra police on there. Um, everybody in the police department is on, but also everybody in all of our crews, except for the water and sewer treatment. All the other crews work at least part of those days. Plus, they work the th two or three days ahead getting everything set up. So. so police time would be a more significant amount in the street fair? Yes, it would. Yes. Everybody's, all staff time, including people, would be a more significant amount. Yes. Now, I'm intrigued. I'm, I'm getting more and more intrigued by Mary Ann's comments about, about the importance of understanding what the different kinds of incentives that uh, are provided for different purposes. And on one hand, I, I hate to think that I'm thinking about another some other layer of evaluation and bureaucracy, because that makes my head hurt. And I think we should try to be as straightforward as we can. But then I also understand that as a village, we're facing, you know, a, a lot of, we want to be very, very responsible with every dollar we spend. You know, this is the community's money. 
And and so I, I'm, as I look at this list, I, I don't like the feeling that I'm weighing their relative merits of these different activities because they are meaningful to some group of constituents. And they, but, but maybe there is some relative merits for the well-being of the village and the community. Maybe we should be thinking about you know, do some of them have different incentives, different investments from the village um, over others? I, I don't know how to quite work that out, but I'm not entirely comfortable just saying that I'm, I'm not comfortable right now saying that I am comfortable with the staff recommendations. I'm compelled by the comments that were made by, you know, I, I, so I'm not comfortable just going forward. But I get. <laughs> But I also get what you're saying about it has an impact on our finances. I, I don't think that we're ready to make, I'm not ready to make a decision. Because <coughs> no. we just asked for this to come. I don't think asking uh, any nonprofit, these are basically all nonprofits, to help pay for their event means that we don't support that nonprofit. So, for example, if we sit, if we tell, if we ask the chamber to pay for some of the services that we're providing, I don't. To me, it's not saying we don't support the work of the chamber. On the other hand, we may decide that um, the eighteen thousand, twenty thousand, whatever that we invest in the chamber is a critical piece of economic development money that we have and we invested in the chamber for that purpose. And and you know, we might want to have a stronger connection. But, I mean, we might want to have some say in that too. I, I don't know. I just think we should be aware of it. <coughs> yeah, I think that's that makes a lot of sense to me because I think about the support that we give with all nonprofits, whether we talk about Paul Mink, which is an important partner, I think the Chamber is an important partner, um, and thinking about how the relationship makes sense for the village in terms of building our capacity, and, and what I, I think it ultimately ends up being a net benefit <coughs> to everyone. But, I mean, I agree that it's a good thing to uh, think about. I don't actually have a suggestion for next steps, except I would like to continue this discussion. Yep. I was going to say it'd be nice to. This is one of those things that you know the public may have some ideas about. Um, so I would say we put it on the table, maybe bring it back at some point, it's relatively soon. You know, with the idea of, as in uh, you know, kind of seeing if the community has. Any Yep. And the other thing is, uh, you know, economic sustainability is pretty busy this next meeting because we're ramping up on our learning curve about DCIC, but it does seem like some input from that body on this seems to fit the charter of that commission. <coughs> that makes sense to me. <coughs> yeah, I, I would like to, you know, my sense is that nonprofits and local businesses really value these events um, but having confirmation of that is, is always good in directing you know what the decisions that we make so if the ESC can help with that I think great it sounds like this is also going to be you know out there and, and I would expect that we would get some more feedback um, similar to letters like we got from Mark so um, okay so I think uh, we will, it will come back, um, probably not for the April 2nd meeting, but uh, maybe the second meeting in April. All right. So then we have the board and commission review, which was actually Judy's mm -hmm. piece. Um, I don't know, I'm tempted to maybe say that we table this because yeah. Judy's done a lot of work yeah. and she's also got this training plan um, which I think <laughs> is with a hilarious photo <laughs> that was the high point of the packet <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah so Should we just sit all that up here so she doesn't have to recopy it out for next time 
Yeah. Um, okay. So then, uh, so we'll bring that back to our next meeting. And um, Lisa, then I have your uh, utility uh, affordability update. Sure, I just want to circle back. I'm not going to take a, a lot of time on it, but um, I just want to, I want to report that um, work has continued um, from when this uh, was originally proposed. On the 5th, the goals haven't shifted. Right now, um, the focus is on specifically on electric utility cost. And uh, I really want to thank um, Melissa and Patty, you know, particularly during this transition time for all the help that you're giving to not lose momentum on this issue that's very, very important to a lot of people in our community, really people from all economic levels. Um, we're, we're trying to understand um, the cost impact of the electric rates on households of various size and also really um, think, I think something that's really popped out for me is uh, you know maybe a month or so ago we heard the budget report which was very very positive and and that's something that we should be really glad that our village is solidly in the black but uh, you know those big those big dollars uh, in those pools uh, don't mean that that's just all this kind of money that we're swimming around it because there's a lot of expenses. So, think I've been thinking about the village just as if it's a big house. It's just our big house, and uh, you know how it is when you have a house and then you know that you're going to get a new furnace and you know you need probably a roof in a couple of years. And so maybe you've put some money together, and it's in a it's in a in an account, but <laughs> that doesn't just mean like hey we can just spend it you know. So really, what we're we're really trying to be um, as as uh, clear as we can to understand what are the major expenses that are going to be coming up over the next few years that we know the village needs. Our house needs repair. All you have to do is walk around and look at it and, and you can tell. So the intention is to try to do all we can, um, particularly around electric rates, but in keeping in mind what's, what's needed. So that's what's going on um, right now. I want to point out, though, there's a bunch of stuff in the packet um, that Marianne pointed out. I want to thank um, uh, Ellis Jacobs as well as other community members who've been sending in a wealth of resources um, about ways that people can help with their own utilities and programs that are out there and HRC is going to be taking that up. So the HRC is going to be focusing more on a programmatic approach and then uh, the finance committee is focusing more on an analysis of what might be done. That Thank you for giving me some time today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think one other piece just to elaborate on is I know that uh, the village team has done some work on thinking specifically about what those infrastructure projects we have, look like. And we actually had a meeting set for Friday that we had to, to we have to cancel because Lisa will be out of town. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, yes, there, and specifically with the um, electric fund, two of the major ones, um, that we have been talking about are um, the uh, Third Circuit, which um, I have all talked at about a million, and Johnny says about 700,000, and he's probably much closer than I am. Um, and well, but then he also said that he needs about 300,000 more dollars worth of poles. <laughs> so, and uh, in addition to that, there are some upgrades at the uh, the, trans, uh, the transfer station that need to happen and some reclosures because these power outages, part of the reason that it happens is the reclosures um, are so old they're not setting properly so it will reduce the number of people affected by outages if we can get our reclosures um, upgraded. What so are, what is that? It's a, it's a thing that when, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's like a circuit breaker. And so when an outage hits, for instance, the other day when uh, the semi hit the guide wire on the pole down on Corian High, about 50 people lost power. If the reclosures had worked properly, um, probably only about five people would have lost power because it would have closed off the rest of the circuit oh. and supplied. 
And it does make it more difficult to find an outage when that happens because you have to run the whole line and figure out what happened. But those are just a few of the that Johnny threw at me today that I was scribbling down the book. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And um, let's go ahead and move into new business. And uh, so the first thing we added was the arts and cultures uh, budget request. Um, one thing I can give by way of background is last year uh, we gave the Arts and Culture Commission four thousand um, for a similar sort of set of projects. Uh, and I think all council members know that we've set aside uh, a total of 25000 for all of our commissions. At this point, only the HRC has uh, requested a budget, which was 8500 So, So what? Uh, any? <coughs> approve the um, Is that what you're? Sure. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, if we don't have any discussion, then uh, I'll, I'll have. That's what is we are discussing. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. so the, the arts and culture request, not yes. the HRC. Request. Right. No, but you're just saying that in total, the the requested budget from commissions in total is well under the budget that's been requested for the year. Right. Yeah. I can uh, make a motion that we go ahead and honor that request. Okay. I'll second. I all right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Yeah, Thank you on behalf of the Yeah, I really think the Willing, Willing Gunnett project is something that I think is very important for us to support. Okay, uh, so then Judith, we uh, have the uh, JSTF request for feedback. Yeah, I just wanted to draw people's attention to something that they're going to see in the newspaper. Uh, the um, JSTF decided some time back that you know, there's uh, certain kinds of recommendations we may want to make to council that we would like to hear from, uh, you know, village citizens, our police officers, the mayor, uh, and we don't want to bring some recommendation and we get it to council and then we get that feedback and we discover that we had it considered some important issues. Uh, so the first time we're intending to use this uh, what's, what's being called notice and comment is uh, this, week, this week we're going to have in the newspaper and I put a little letter to the other day but we're going to have a little uh, notice and it's uh, it's about uh, a recommendation that those kind of adopt a policy requiring the use of the Yellow Springs Mayor's Court for all misdemeanor cases occurring in the village unless otherwise required and uh, that's pretty much all it's going to say. It's, it says, uh, you know, here's how to get, give us feedback, you know, through the clerk or to come to our meeting on April 10th. We will also be um, noticing police department through the chief and we'll be communicating with the mayor and then we'll take all that information and people are welcome to come to our next meeting, which is April 10th, when we will make a decision on that recommendation if we're going to make any uh, adjustments to it. So I just wanted to draw your attention to it in case anybody asks you questions about it. Uh, so it'll be, you know, an official notice for the next three weeks in the newspaper. So I I did have one question. So yeah. Um, I mean, on its face, uh, using our mayor's court, you know, maximizing its use, totally makes sense to me. I guess I'm just wondering. I mean. How how will people provide any I don't know critical feedback um, about this proposal? I mean, is there is there more information to understand that? Well, um, there was more information presented to uh, the meeting, and we had a very interesting, I thought, discussion about it. Um, but we thought when we noticed it, we didn't want to try to make the case for it, <laughs> I guess. But that was the, that was what was decided, mm -hmm. uh, that we just sort of put it out there. I mean, people have been thinking about it. We thought probably the main place we would hear more concrete I, uh, thoughts was from the police department and uh, the mayor. They have some thoughts there, too. Um, though, you know, the policy is towards our more towards the police department since they make the citations. And so, um, so I don't know. That was the rationale behind it. 
mm -hmm. is not putting any rationale in the statement. Right. And, and I think the only thing that the only thing that I would be concerned that people I think people should know before they give the feedback I think is important that they know that what can and can't be cited to mayor's court because as you point out in the policy there are some things that can't be and so I think that that's important so I don't know that if maybe a, just a little informational sheet that can go with that you know that can, or can be left here for pickup or just put on the Facebook page or something that says when you're giving this feedback keep in mind here's what has to go to Z by law and here's what can be cited to mayor's because there are a few things that we don't have a choice on. Well, I mean, it says that. It, it's a little complicated to explain yeah. it. But that's the problem. <laughs> but for instance, getting it to yeah. try to get into right. it. I mean, I mean, yeah, one specific thing is that a lot of folks would like to see juvenile cited mayor's court. Well, as it stands right now, you cannot cite a juvenile mayor's court. And so I think it's important for people to understand those things. Well, I do think when this comes back and, and because I assume we'll be making a decision. We'll be right? discussing um, it. Yeah. I think it would be important to have that in the packet mm -hmm. um, so that people do understand what the limits are. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I know where I stand on this, I guess, but I, I guess that, that's always been a thing for me is if there is kind of a, another side or something um, that would inform people's feedback. But I, I don't, I don't yeah, know. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. For sure. And the, the only other thing that I think about, first of all, I, I think this is excellent to formalize ways to get feedback from the community. I, I think it's it's exciting. I think it's really positive. <coughs> I think it's consistent with our values. Um, you know, when you're doing data collection, I go back and forth on on uh, anonymity, you know, and privacy and. On one hand, if people have their names, you know, and they send your email, then then there's their name. Maybe some people aren't as comfortable sharing their ideas. But then I did wonder if um, before Justice System Task Force receives this input from the public, if um, it's all coming to Judy, right? It's coming to Judy or going to, um, or the people coming to the meeting, and then, um, there's a slightly different process with the police department where there is the possibility for anonymity. I'm just wondering if, if uh, responses that come in via email could be anonymized uh, before they come to Justice System Task Force as well. Just, you know, for more neutrality, maybe that adds work, but um, it's just an idea. And, and, and in which case, I don't think we're going to be able to do it this time. This yeah. is our kind of our first this is effort. Yeah. So, yeah, hearing <coughs> the pro how, you know, if there's ways to improve the process uh, that people want to think about. That's, that's good. Yeah, I just didn't think of that before. All right. All right, well, thank you. Uh, and I agree. I, I like this effort to be more intentional about getting feedback. So, um, all right, then it looks like we're moving into the reports. This is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, Patty, would you like to start with the uh, manager's report? Um, yeah, the only thing that I'm going to reiterate again is about the no discolored water tomorrow um, because the route exercising machine did not come in. It may occur later this week or next week. We will let you know as soon as we get a date we will put that up on the website um, and the, the website the Facebook page and ask the YS News to put it up online for us like they always do uh, and we appreciate very much um, and don't forget that uh, water for drinking and cooking is available at the Yellow Springs Police Department dispatch window when that happens um, and the only other thing I want to point out is um, we, we are still taking the Gaunt Park pool positions that a lot of local uh, youth apply for those. And I want to congratulate Peter Bussey on getting his class two sewer collection license and Dale Fisher on getting his class one, which is very important for our continued operation. So if anybody has any questions on anything else, answer those. Well, did we want to talk about the pool right now? I think Lisa, you had asked kind of Separate. Yeah, I think so because I, I see that there is a, that revenue information is there. 
and and thank you for that. But I think we still don't know the cost side. So I think next meeting we'll have to know for the repairs. But um, yeah. you know, I I have to say that <coughs> after the comment that was made about communities that support things, as I was looking at the um, the cost of the pool, I was thinking of a of an amazing book that I've recently read called Dreamland, The True Tale of America's Opiate Epidemic that's by Sam Pinones. And what you might not know if you haven't read the book is Dreamland is a swimming pool. It's a community swimming pool. And the whole book starts with this story about this community swimming pool and what it meant to the community. And how it meant when that kind of went away, the community began to fall apart. And so, you know, given some of the other conversations tonight about being a community that supports activities and supports things, I, it's an amazing book. And I want to keep it front of my mind when we talk about the pool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we should put that as a separate item. I agree. And I wondered if we should have a little the, uh, the thing from the um, Municipal League about, you know, you isn't this regarding this is regarding you had said that the state legislatures acted like the Ohio Municipal League had not <coughs> an opinion about it. And right. So I, I'm still curious. Well, so how did how is it that they that the you know uh, state legislatures are making saying that when this fellow from the Ohio Municipal League is saying the exact opposite? So I'm well. I, I can tell you that we don't have an answer to that, but Ken Scared is going to get it because he was very upset. Uh huh. And, I sent him an email, Excellent. and ten minutes later, he was on. The phone. Okay, because that that made no sense to me uh, when Brian said that was what was said, and that's really he was he was very upset. I so he, he was following up on that himself. Yeah. So it, this is regarding the state collecting our taxes, that uh, legislation, and Brian was saying when he was at the state, what state they claimed that they had no negatives about it from the Ohio Municipal League, which we didn't understand because they've always been very strong on these kind of issues. Right. And it turns like it sounds like maybe it wasn't true. Yeah, he was. <laughs> maybe he they was, said things that were yeah. not true. Kent was very upset and it I think in ten minutes he was on the phone with me. So. Okay. Um Melissa. Um this past week I received a check from the Army Corps of Engineers for two hundred and sixty six thousand eight hundred and ninety five dollars and thirty two cents, which closes out that grant account finally. Very timely. So um, just as a recap, the village paid two hundred and fifty nine thousand and some change for the infrastructure project and we're receiving <coughs> back almost two hundred and sixty seven thousand. So um, some of my early estimates proved to be true that we would be getting back more money than what we were investing at the time for that infrastructure project. So that grant is now closed out, which is great. And then um, just a few loose end pieces of legislation before I leave. Next meeting will be my last meeting, so I want to make sure that I've got everything um, ready to go and uh, tied up so that the transition is very smooth. So I'm going to do supplemental appropriations and transfer ordinance and then um, the pool legislation for, uh, for adding the, the one rate to that. And then we'll have the, the fees as well. So, or not the fees, the uh, construction estimates as well for the different projects that need to be done. So that's it for me. Okay, Sergeant Knapp. I did want to say I like this uh, new format. <coughs> Um, that's that's very useful. And uh, the statistics report. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought that was really good. I'm glad that worked out. Yeah. And it seems like that. We didn't get that part oh. copy. No. Yeah. Uh, like okay. okay. Uh, I have a question. It says the total offenses reported were 125, mm -hmm. and the total citations were 63. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that the other 62, or whatever it is, were given warnings? Uh, I'm not sure on that. I think what that actually is is when we have total citations issued, that includes uh, warnings, uh, criminal arrest, and traffic citations that are issued, all lumped together in that one large uh, dot or amount that you see there. The 62 would be total. Okay. 
But if the total <coughs> offenses were 125. Well, there's offense reports that we take, criminal reports that we wouldn't have arrests or citations issued for, so that number will always be skewed. We don't make an arrest every time we get a case. Yeah, that's a so it could be for like someone breaking into a car if you don't have a suspect. Right, right. If we had a vehicle theft, we didn't know who did it, there wouldn't be an associated citation or arrest made with that case report because the person who did it was unknown. Well, like, like say someone is speeding and you stop them, mm -hmm. but you decide to give them a warning because maybe they were 11 miles or something. True. Now, would that fall into the offense report? No. No, the citations issued or whatever includes traffic warnings, traffic citations, and then criminal tickets that are issued. Um, any other arrests that maybe were warrant arrests or were felonies where we don't issue tickets for those, those aren't included. Well, maybe you should explain what a criminal ticket is. <laughs> so most, most of our criminal tickets are issued for misdemeanor offenses that, um, that we are involved in, that we have a suspect for, a case reports, if somebody reports, somebody stole something out of the car. And we know who did it, and we were able to go get them and solve our case, and we were able to issue a criminal citation and summon them to court. Very quick for that, for example. We issue them a summons, they show up, that's a citation. So it goes down as a, it would be an associated offense report, offense report taken, um, but the citation was also issued out of that case. I guess, I don't know. Maybe that even more confusing. <laughs> Citations are not just moving violations. Right, they're not just moving violations. They can be criminal violations and warnings. Actually, criminal warnings, too. We give people warnings for, for criminal violations all the time. So they can include all of those. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Yeah. All right. Um, and thanks again for all the work on the policy stuff, too. Excellent. Um, all right. Uh, Chris? Uh, I've got nothing to add at this. All right. And I think Judy's... Actually, I do. Oh. Uh, the, that appeal was filed in the HB 49 litigation. Okay. And which court was that filed in? Uh, it would be Franklin County. Okay. Right. 10th District. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think Judy said busy business as usual. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, uh, we're on to board and commission reports. I know... Uh, hopefully Tom will get here soon. Yeah, I, um, I, I have um, submitted written reports for, for my reports. Yes. <laughs> um, and I, I, so I'm not going to go over everything that I have in my report. I guess a couple things that I didn't uh, say, I just want to acknowledge uh, Nadia Malarkey who sponsored the Beyond Pesticide Workshop a couple weeks ago. It was an all-day workshop and brought in two national people who work in this field, and that was pretty incredible. And also, it was very, um, really liked working with the Tecumseh Land Trust on the Glass Farm Project, Environmental Commission. So, I have the written Environmental Commission annual report. I don't know whether we want to, I sort of suspect <coughs> that Tom is not coming. <laughs> I, I texted him, I didn't get a response to him. So I can either go over it or I can ask him to come and give it. I, I kind of was feeling like he should come. And okay, maybe just okay, we can ask it. him to do that. And the just, I will say that there are three things that the Environmental Commission is going to bring to council to, uh, as recommendations. And uh, one is the, the revisions to the source water protection plan, the wellhead protection plan. So we have, that has been completed. Uh, the second is the climate action plan that <coughs> has been completed and approved by the Environmental Commission. And but we have not submitted these to council. Right, and I saw the, the document that was in the packet um, I assume that was related to the climate action plan, the risk assessment? No. No? No. Um, I can address that. Okay. The, and the third is uh, a recommendation that we establish a commission or a subcommission of the Environmental Commission to provide oversight management of the last one, uh, conservation area. 
So they will be coming, and we can talk about when we want them to come to council. But, uh, that, is that different than the beaver management? It, it's, it's taking the beaver management task force and, and making some change, enlarging the scope of, of what that group has been doing to cover the glass farm area, to, to cover the wetlands as well as the <coughs> And the risk assessment <coughs> is for our 2018 goals. Okay. And we're still in the progress of the process of developing that. So we don't actually have the goals yet. Uh, well, I thought it was an interesting document. And it, yeah. it seemed to speak to things that we're trying to do with the Climate Action Plan. Yeah. Uh, the, Deanna uh, Newsom, who works for the Rainforest either network or alliance, I can't remember. It's a process that she uses in her organization. So she she had us use that process. So. Cool. Okay, well I will tell Tom to come. <coughs> right, and, and who knows, maybe uh, we've got some more board commission stuff, maybe he'll get here before um, we... Yeah, but I would like to take this opportunity to nominate him uh, for a second term mm -hmm. on the environmental commission. Mm -hmm. he's, he's a very active member of EC. He works in uh, the environmental engineer. He is an environmental engineer. He's our secretary, and uh, he's been one of the team members on the class one project. And it's great to have him. So I hope to nominate him. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. But he's willing to stay on board. Okay. Um, so did you have any? any no, I, unless someone has, I reported on Advisory Committee, Housing Advisory Committee, Planning Commission, Village Mediation Program, and Environmental Commission. And, and my, um, my reports are also on file, and given that both uh, Arts and Culture and Economic Sustainability presented their annual reports and foreshadowed uh, the goal setting and plan, you know, that's been kind of the focus. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have anything additional to add. Okay. You know, I forgot to mention when uh, the Arts and Culture's report happened. Uh, something I meant to ask is, you know, the pot shop is the bill, the pot shop, you know, yeah. uh, yeah. so I run a community Do you mean the community pottery? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, community pot shop. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's what it used to be called. But it, okay. it still is. <laughs> okay. I, use, I call it that. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> right, that's, that's what I meant. Pottery. Well, if, pottery. You, if you get a dispensary, you won't be able to call that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> Okay. Um, I just, I mean, I'm remembering that they have programs that um, they try to make accessible to, you know, young people, etc. But anyway, I just wondered what the relationship is between the pottery shop, you know, given that it's a facility of the village, and the arts commission, and I guess I Right. A couple years that. back, we did have um, the director of community pottery was um, coming to the arts and culture meetings, mm -hmm. um, but currently not much of a relationship. I do know, though, that that is still something that, as far as those community programs that are part of you know, their agreement with the village, they still do those. Okay. Yeah, I just kind of lost track of it. Yeah. It would be nice to hear a report from them. I, I yeah. kind of was feeling like we haven't heard from them, I think, since I've been back on the and they, and they have a new director. Uh, okay. Well, I don't, I don't right. know their name quite yet. I haven't met them, but Crystal left. But, um, and and they, they do lease from us, but they, they aren't village. Well, we had an agreement, and anyway, it would yeah. be nice to hear from you. Yeah, let's try to, uh, <clears throat> let's try to, uh, uh, through the Arts and Culture Commission, uh, out and do some outreach again. Because um, it was nice to have someone there regularly. It's a, it's um, a great resource, and yeah. it is a community resource. Um, and okay, that was, sorry, I forgot to say earlier. Um, so, um, Energy Board, we switched the day, so I was like, I was like, I can't remember what happened. So I wanted to report on, and it's, the meeting is tomorrow. <laughs> so we haven't had a meeting since the last report. Uh, Library Commission hasn't had a meeting, because uh, we're on quarterly now. The Justice System Task Force, um, the other thing that, things that are going on, just so people who may have an interest, um, uh, there is a new little working group on issue of surveillance, you know, with the new technology that makes more and more, you know, your ability to have privacy less and less. 
and the way that that interfaces with uh, law enforcement um, is something that a lot of communities, um, uh, Ellis brought this to the committee, um, are actually trying to put some parameters around. And for example, when there are, um, you know, even the police um, uh, cameras and how those, those images are stored and how long and just those kind of questions. Um, evidently, a lot of communities are really looking at that because, you know, it, it's sort of a Pandora's box that's been opened. And um, so we want to be keeping an eye on it. So they're doing some research. Uh, they're looking for uh, citizens who might be interested in participating because uh, our work committees have citizens who are not members of the task force on them. So, mm -hmm. so if there's anybody interested in that, they can let the clerk know and pass it on to the JSTF. Um, the, um, there's a, the group uh, has just been started. We're just getting going uh, where we're looking at disparate impacts of the justice system on people of low income, poor people, and, um, and you know how we can be changing that through working with our mayor's courts, our great hope. And, and um, we had the first very good meeting, uh, so we're working on that. Again, if there's anybody interested to join us, um, there's always more to do. And then um, the police uh, working group, you know, has um, uh, one thing that was brought up. I mean, they tried to support the chief and the department around training issues. Um, one recommendation they had made, and then there was, I don't know if it came to council, was this idea of sponsoring a potential officer to the local academy. And I wanted to bring it up because there was kind of a question of, you know, we, we had this idea, you know, <coughs> nothing was really done with it. So I thought if the council was at all interested in them doing more research, like what does it cost and, you know, how do you, you know, evidently other communities sometimes have these kind of programs. Um, and the idea would, you know, be that if, if we help them get their training, then they would be, you know, committed to our department for some period of time. <coughs> We're actually already working on that. Oh, you are? Uh, the chief and I have talked about it a okay. couple of times, and then... Um, okay, I'm, we weren't Brian, sure it was what was happening with yeah, it. Brian I didn't know if we needed to be more. Okay. Yeah, just earlier well, this... No, I, I, will let them, I, will let them, I will let the committee know that there's actually some action behind the scenes going on in that. Yeah, did you... Had you already mentioned Tony Ortiz? Or did you know that? <coughs> so that was uh, the meeting that we had. He is the um, uh, the diversity liaison, right? Uh, for okay. the Attorney General's office. Okay. And that was something that he talked about okay. uh, as, as something awesome. that could accomplish. Well, work. if there's any support work we could do, uh, let us know. You know, to research it. If you guys are handling it, that's totally fine. Um, I think. And then the mayor's court has been working on this uh, recommendation that you know we're asking for input on. So that's the work we've been doing. Oh, and I have a motion to add uh, to I'm nominating Beth Crandall to be an official member of the commission. She worked very closely around the data uh, report. Uh, she's excellent, and I totally think we should put her on the commission. Second. All, right. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Lisa, I just <clears throat> remembered with your um, finance committee report, was was there a request that you wanted that was at the end of that that you wanted to highlight or well really um, yeah it was it was more really asking for uh, the support of from council for some continued you know to keep working on it, to continue to do a focused analysis. Um, taking into account the major infrastructure costs that we know are coming up, but that we could continue to explore different rate structures. Okay. And, and I certainly support those efforts. I think they make a lot of sense. Um, Thank you. Um, great. Well, uh, yeah, go ahead, Judith. I was going to say, I can start this. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I don't have a lot to highlight. I think what I wrote was mostly just to give us some perspective about what's going on around our borders. Uh, now that I'm attending these Green County Regional Planning Commission meetings and seeing, you know, Sugar, Tree, Sugar Creek Township in particular, but other townships are just kind of exploding with these developments, 400 plus units. Um, so 
Uh, anyway, so that's going on all around the county. And uh, the upside, at least, is these are all contemplating trails and green space and not planting invasives. So at least there are not some. Uh, <laughs> right, not allowing. Well, and I guess now it's kind of illegal to buy them, right? <laughs> is that, that's what I've been told. Illegal to buy what? Uh, invasive. invasive species. Oh. Yes. Right. Oh, it's coming. Yeah. Tom All right. Is coming. Perfect timing. So, um, and uh, as Tom gets a chance to settle, I'll just uh, I'll just also say within the RPC, I I got to compliment um, Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission on the Complete Streets uh, workshop and guidance that they gave us and a lot of our <coughs> communities were very intrigued by uh, this concept oh yes i i am now on the executive committee for mbrpc so i'm representing green county <laughs> so they're going to hear even more about trails and no invasives and everything else um, all right, so uh, perfect time, Tom. We uh, move the economic or environmental commission uh, report to now. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks thank for you. fitting me in to the schedule that accommodate my schedule, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to council about the environmental commission. Uh, it's been a really great year. Sorry, probably can can you hear me? Okay, mm -hmm. okay so yeah, that's more for the, uh, the right. audience at home. Okay. So, um, so the 2017, 2017 was a really good year for the Environmental Commission because, you know, it really started to take, get some traction. We've been planting a lot of seeds figuratively and, <laughs> and uh, really in the ground. Um, but uh, these, these efforts are starting to manifest, so we're actually seeing some things. So that's what this report actually has some tangible progress. So, in 2017, uh, for example, Glass Farm efforts, the conservation area, and we got a grant for in 2016, a two-year grant, and so a lot of the fruits of that labor have, have come. And, um, for example, all the invasive pears and Japanese honeysuckles removed, uh, four acres of prairie was planted, uh, th over 300 trees and shrubs were planted, native trees and shrubs. Um, some stone benches were created by a local stone, stone mason. So the place and signs were designed, so all that stuff is really um, making that project wrapping it up. Actually, it's completing this month, so on next year's annual report, you get a little bit extra. <laughs> um, uh, and I also want to give a shout out to um, to the village staff for assisting with mowing and, and doing some other maintenance on the site. So that's been a good collaboration. Uh, climate Action Plan um, has been developing. Um, did, did, you'll be getting a report uh, showing some of the fruits of the labor of that effort. Um, but but uh, so that was a lot of the focus of 2017 was actually developing this um, planning document. Um, it's not a complete climate action plan, but a lot of research has gone into it and developing potential actions um, and opportunities for the village. So that is has been moving along. Um, the waste, reducing waste and increasing recycling has been a new focus that's kind of um, we got a new member last year, Tina Stolzenberg, who's kind of taking up that. Um, and so making some efforts there, uh, looking into ways to increase recycling and um, especially targeting uh, one of the big opportunities there is with apartments because you know, all the residents have access to recycling, but not all the most apartment buildings do not. A lot of research there and, and making headway. Um, another big thing that's been uh, ongoing and uh, came to a completion is the source water protection plan or the wellhead protection plan. So terms are kind of interchangeable. Um, 
but there was an existing plan from 2001 that needed to be updated, so it should have been, you know, it needs to be updated fairly more frequently than it was. Um, so we did uh, a lot of research there, um, again, collaborating with, with the village staff, um, especially at the water plant. Um, and that also, I think the completion of the update will be in 2018 again. But um, and one of the other important factors there is that uh, there's an education component of, of the uh, wellhead protection plan. So a lot of educational materials have been developed which should be coming out this year, which coordinates perfectly with the, the installation and the and finalizing construction of the new water plant. It's a perfect <coughs> uh, synergy there. And then uh, promoting the reduction of pesticide use. Again, another good collaboration <coughs> with village staff. Village staff came out in, um, to, okay, this happened in 2018 also. But a lot of the groundwork was laid in 2017 to um, get resources and information and speakers to come out and do an a all-day workshop for uh, practitioners, including village staff and other local municipalities that we reached out to, trying to do a lot of outreach and now even working. Um, and uh, had these experts come in and talk about ways to reduce pesticide use um, and organic lawn care and that type of thing, both for residents, and then there was an evening workshop for residents, but uh, the, uh, the practitioner-focused workshop was an all-day exercise. Um, also, some groundwork was laid for re rebooting the pond and regeneration <coughs> projects. So, um, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it, and I, I know I've just talked an awful lot, but did you all have any questions from the report or from anything that I just said, or do you back for us? It's excellent. I mean, I, I'm very uh, excited about the uh, climate action plan piece moving forward, so I'm going to be looking forward to that. And I had mentioned before you came in, I, I like the, uh, the risk assessment document that, uh, that I saw that was in the packet. Good. So it's great. Good. Thank you. Yeah, the, we had a... Uh, had a good, the past two years we've done a uh, sort of a retreat at the beginning of the year to lay our plans and look at goals and risk assessment was, was one of the things we did uh, this year's um, retreat. All right. Anything else? Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> and thanks to our Marianne, our main uh, liaison, and Lisa for being the back up now. Thank you. All right. Thanks for uh, <laughs> taking the time to get here. <laughs> yeah, you bet. Thanks for fitting me in. Okay. So, uh, so I think we're moving to uh, agenda planning, and uh, there is a lot of legislation on the horizon. Um, and um, I know we've talked about a few, a few things that we want to be thinking about. We've got. So, you know, I'm seeing that the resolution for climate action, source water protection, and glass farm are all listed for mm -hmm. the second. Council may, each one of them would deserve some time, especially the climate action and the source water protection. Right. So I'm wondering whether we want to have them all. I think we, I don't think we should. And, you know, I think they probably got... They, they were there as a holding place. Um, is, if we pick one for next meeting, would that be source water? Well, <coughs> um, if we did the glass farm conservation, that would really finalize that that work. I, I really, Tom, you probably didn't see, but there was a really good document in our packet from Hope Half about groundwater. And if we can get her involved in some way to come here and help our education program on source water protection, ground, I would love to do right. that. Well, you know she so lives in the county, right? Yeah, she's real close so by. So that's why I, I'd like to pull the source water off mm -hmm. um, to 
see whether we might be able to get her to come. So we're leaving source water and glass farm? No, we're going to keep the glass farm. Okay. Glass farm. <coughs> so we're just moving the source water. Source water. And I don't know. To, to the 16? I don't have a sense of how much time the climate action comes. Well, I can't speak for can't really speak for Dury because he's really heat heading this up. Um, but uh, so I don't know what is it. I know he has a presentation or you know yeah. to present the information, which is opportunities and potential next steps. Um, so I don't know if you just want it to be an informational presentation or if you want to have the dialogue or if he's hoping to have more of a dialogue about. Sure, he wants to get some next steps laid out too. So, okay. Um, but but it is ready to go for yes, April second. Yes, Okay. Yeah. Well, a lot of this legislation is not going to take a significant amount of time, so it may be a good discussion to keep on for April second. Uh, but we can look at that again. Um, I I do see the designated CIC discussion will have to move to the 16th because ESC doesn't have a meeting until the 4th, um, if it's even ready for that meeting. Um, and uh, does anyone see anything else, I guess, that we should be prioritizing for the 2nd in particular? I mean, I guess I would say, in terms of the source water projection, that there is the plan itself kind of proving it, and then there's the education. If we wanted to do the source water projection on our next meeting, we could do that but to affirm the update plan and then come back maybe another time with the education. Patty, do you have one? Um, I, I guess I don't really have a, a firm idea either way. I mean, the plan itself is done, but I think some of the educational thing kind of got um, laid to the side because um, George was going to help on those and now he's unable to be a member um, any longer. So they probably aren't ready quite yet. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, we could get the, the update itself off our plates. If that's what we wanted to do and then develop the, the uh, educational materials uh, and, and bring those back as we go. I mean, the updates, I were, the updates well, were fairly simple, so. <laughs> well, for one thing, I could see whether Dewey would be available at our next meeting. Okay. Because he's critical for the climate. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we already said that. <coughs> um, maybe we can see how much time we think it's, things are going to take for agenda planning. Yep. Decide then about the source water protection. Okay. That sounds good. Um, so any other? Um, yeah. I'm wondering, I'm looking to see again <coughs> when those housing community meetings are. Mm -hmm. Is this there need to be a loop to get information back from that? Well, our next meeting is going to be the 28th, I think. But uh, you're Where talking you about the information meeting? back after they're yeah, all done. Yeah, right. back to council. Yeah, yeah. They, they won't all be done until the, they won't the be done. 21st of, yeah, cool. the 21st of April is the last one. Yeah. So. The pool thing. <laughs> yeah. Is that great decision? Mm -hmm. That's all I can think of. Okay. And we do have the pool. The pool rates are on there. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that looks good. And uh, so if there is nothing else, uh, I will ask for a motion to move into executive session for the purpose of potential litigation. I move that we move into executive session for the purpose of potential litigation. Second. Uh, we do a roll call? We do. Um, Hempwin? Yes. Crater? Yes. McQueen? Yes. House? Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.